Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everyone. My name is Lucia Lohman, and I'm a faculty at the University of Sao Paulo and also the ATBC Executive Director. And I'm really pleased to be your moderator in the session today, which is entitled Conservation Genetics and Genomics in the Face of Global Change. Please remember that you may submit questions for the speakers at any time during the presentations, but please submit your questions through the Zoom Q&A button and not through the question function on WUVA. And while you're submitting questions, please remember to indicate to which speaker your question is going to. So I'm really pleased to, uh, to uh, introduce you to our speakers today. So we have Abhishek Gopal from the Center for Cell and Molecular Biology in India. Um, we also have Sabrina Aninta from the Query Mary University of London in the UK. Misato Ogasahara from Ehimi University in Japan. Chanel Wikramanayake from the California University. Abdul Kabir Abdul Malik from University of Lorraine in Nigeria. Alan Din Dipita from the University of Douala in Cameroon and Kuyulun Lin from Kyoto University in Japan. So we'll now begin with the presentations. Please enjoy it. Hello all, thank you for coming for my talk. I'm Abhishek, a first year PhD student in Center for Cellular and Molecular Biology in India. And I'll be presenting some of my preliminary results of my first chapter. Ecological and evolutionary history influenced by geological and climatic factor play an important role in structuring the patterns of regional and local community assembly. While the ecological processes that govern the patterns of community assembly are well understood, the role of evolutionary history in driving these patterns while acknowledged is limited. Integrating phylogenetic information with community ecology can help link evolutionary and biogeographic histories with contemporary ecological processes. Examining the phylogenetic structure and the patterns of turnover of species across space and time can aid in discerning the relative roles of these processes in shaping the community assembly. Broadly, we examine the relative roles of these processes in shaping the di phylogenetic diversity, endemism, and turnover of species in the Western Ghats. Within the Western Ghats, while the drivers and patterns of taxonomic diversity are well understood, the phylogenetic aspect has been less well explored, especially in terms of endemism. The Western Ghats mountain chain spans over 1,600 kilometers and is considered a biodiversity hotspot due to high levels of diversity and endemicity. Almost 60% of the plants found here are endemic. Being part of the Indian subcontinent, it has a complex geographical history. The extant taxa show both Gondwanan and Asian affinities. Extensive volcanic activity towards the end of the Cretaceous uh, triggered mass extinction in the peninsular India, affecting the northern western Ghats disproportionately more. Furthermore, the eridification of the peninsular India, along with the intensification of the monsoon, led to the contraction of the rainforest longitudinally. Consequently, the southern western Ghats are hypothesized to act as a refugia for several taxa across different time periods. The Western Ghats are further divided into three subdivisions based on the phytogeography and the environmental conditions, namely the Northern Central and the Southern Western Ghats. Given the history of the Western Ghats and the gradient in lower level factors in terms of age, stability, isolation, and environment conditions, uh, in the case of alpha diversity, the community in the higher latitudes are likely to have low phylogenetic diversity with relatively young lineages and the community in the lower latitudes are likely to have much higher phylogenetic diversity with many old and young lineages, primarily due to low extinction and high speciation. In terms of beta diversity, the northern latitudes are likely to be characterized by high phylogenetic nestedness driven by wide ranging species and the southern western cars are likely to be characterized by high turnover due to range restricted endemic species. From primary plot data, species occurrences were collated and species wise a distribution models were created for evergreen species found in the Western Ghats. The current analysis was done for a subset of species and was done at a 10 by 10 kilometer resolution. The analysis was done at two scales, 
across western ghats and within the three biogeographic subdivisions coming to the results in terms of the alpha indices of phylogenetic diversity and endemism the results were consistent and in line with the expectation of integrated time area stability hypothesis where the lower latitudes due to their relative stability show much higher phylogenetic diversity and endemism in terms of turnover at the scale of western ghats the phylogenetic turnover was higher in the lower latitudes examining the results within the biogeographic subdivisions the southern western ghats had much higher phylogenetic diversity than the null expectation mean phylogenetic distance and the mean nearest neighbor distance were both high in the southern western ghats indicating over dispersion at the both basal node and at the tips of the phylogeny that is more distantly related lineages and taxa are found in the southern western ghats as compared to the other subdivisions in the case of phylogenetic turnover we found a contrasting result over expectation while not significantly different from the null among the three subdivisions the southern western ghats uh, had the least turnover adding more species and examining these trends at a finer resolution might help in validating this result so the results presented here are preliminary and the next step is to examine the environment and spatial drivers of these trends and to examine if they influence the changes along with within the biogeographic zones shown here are some trends with annual precipitation and temperature for endemism and the colors represent the different biogeographic zones and additionally the further steps are to refine the quality of the data by adding in more occurrence location for species and also to incorporate other plant habits such as understory shrubs etc to examine the diversity and turnover pattern from the functional perspective as well and examine the trait space occupied by the paleo as well as neo endemic and lastly to experimentally test the drivers of over dispersion and clustering with a subset of species that's about it thank you hi everyone my name is sabrina i'm a phd student from queen mary university of london and also from natural history museum of uk here going to talk to you about how genomics could help with con conservations of Wallacea's endemic ungulates, Babirusa, and Anoa. Babirusa literally means big deer because it looks like a pig with tusks that looks like deer's antler. And Anoa in local language means dwarf buffalo because it looks like a buffalo but it's half the size of the common buffalo in the main Anoa and Babirusa are endemic to the Wallacea region in the Southeast Asia. This is an area with unique biogeographic history as it is the, the meeting between two tectonic plates and also having relatively quite young geological period. Unfortunately, the two taxa is experiencing massive decline in the recent years. Report by Indonesian government in 2018 reported 28% decline from baseline for Babirusa and 7.3 for Anoa. This is likely because of massive hunting pressure and habitat degradation that is happening because of massive deforestation events in the early 2000s that is likely to happen until the coming decades under business as usual scenario. Thus, it is important to understand how these two taxa will prevail in the face of anthropogenic disturbances. Recent genetic research found that there is population bottleneck someone in the past, but we don't know if this is an ancient one happening millions of years ago during the period of climatic fluctuation or as recent as the year 2000 when the major deforestation is happening. We could check this by understanding recent inbreeding that could be detected by runs of homozygosity. To understand this, let, let this be two unrelated individuals mating with each other and having kids. When their kids are mating with unrelated individuals, and somehow there is a population decline that forced the two cousins to mate with each other, the kids of the two, of the two cousins will have segments that could be traced back to their grandparents, and this is called runs of homozygosity or in short, Rho. Rho is signs of recent inbreeding, and the longer Rho is, the more recent inbreeding is happening, and the shorter it is, the more ancient the inbreeding is happening. And we could check this with whole genome sequencing that allows us a very detailed resolution of the genotypes across genome that enables us to check if there are segments with runs of homozygous genotypes. 
Our results found different degree of inbreeding in both taxa. You can see here that the most inbred individuals in Babirusa and Anua is not the same in different regions. So most of the short fragments are abundant in the southeast Babirusa uh, while the Anua, the most inbred ones, are from Bhutan. Note that the smaller island of Togian has different row profile with Anua from the smaller island and in the southeast Sulawesi Peninsula, the Anua is less inbred than the Babirusa, indicating that these two taxa are experiencing different demographic pressure. In conclusion, most of the populations are showing signs of recent inbreeding with all this prevalent inbreeding happening around the 1980s, way before the major deforestation events in the early 2000s. This is assuming the recombination rate that is breaking the rogue is constant, one centimorgan, which is, un which is, we don't know. So this should be checked further. Anoa and Babirusa in the south are likely to experience different demographic processes, as you can see how, how different they are, and in need in different population management than individuals in the north. So here we have shown that whole genome sequencing could be used to assist population management of these two taxa. With that, I would like to thank you. The following names and institution for making this research possible and you for listening. I'll be happy to take any questions after this or through Twitter or through my email or any means you prefer. Thank you. Hello everyone. Thank you for coming to our talk. I'm Misato Ogasahara from Ehime University, Japan. In this meeting, I present Assessment of Genetic Variations and Genetic Structures of Shara Arvida Diptorocarposis in Brunei Dar es Salaam. Peace from forests is one of the major forest types of Southeast Asia. But peace from forests have been threatened by deforestation. This forest develops on peat formed by the accumulation of poorly decomposed organic matter. So deforestation leads to the emission of carbon. Also, peat from forests host endemic species. So deforestation leads to loss of the endemic species. So rehabilitation and conservation of peace from forests are important. For rehabilitation and conservation, genetic information about dominant tree species in the peace from forests is crucial. But this information is poor. In this study, we focus one peace from tree species, Shorea albida. This species forms one dominant stand in peace from forest in North Borneo. This species is threatened by logging or road construction. But this species remains abundant in Brunei Dar es Salaam. Populations of Shara Vida in Brunei are fragmented and genetic differentiation among populations have not been studied. So we examined the genetic variation in natural populations of Shara Vida in Brunei to support project on peat from forest conservation. Especially, we evaluated a pattern of genetic variation and level of genetic divergence among populations. We collected samples from 11 locations in Bright District, Brunei. 11 sampling locations are indicated by black circle on upper figure. We genotyped 18 microsatellites for 166 individual for sure avida. This data was used to estimate genetic diversity and differentiation among populations. We summarize the result in three. The first is that genetic diversity is similar level among populations, even if population density is different. 
the mean value of expected heterozygosity is 0.4. The red area of the upper figure indicates the region where shear VW dominates. We thought that high population density leads to high genetic diversity. However, in this study, a difference in genetic diversity level is not observed. So genetic diversity is similar level among populations regardless of population density. The second is that the highest value of inbreeding coefficient was observed in only Butters Pipeline East. The value of inbreeding coefficient in Butters Pipeline is 0.11. This suggests that there is a possible that inbreeding is advancing in Butters Pipeline East. The third is that population number 4, Inge, and population number 8, level 3, are genetically different populations from others. The below figure was obtained from clustering analysis. Birds in this figure indicate the genetic composition in each individual. This clustering analysis shows that individual from Inge or level 3 populations is belonging to different clusters. So finally, in our poster, we will mention the formation history of Shire Arbiza populations in Brunei related to peace swamps formations. So if you have interest in, please check our poster. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'll be telling you about how we use genetic structure to inform conservation of a Sri Lankan lizard. Sri Lanka is a biodiversity hotspot and much of this biodiversity and endemism is found in the southwestern rainforest ecoregion. This is especially true for reptiles of which roughly 75% are endemic to Sri Lanka. One of these species is the rough-nosed horn lizard whose range is depicted in green over here. They are characterized by a rostral horn in males and they are also endemic and endangered and are highly sensitive to changes in their environment. To find the genetic structure, we sampled individuals across the distribution and looked at two genetic markers, the ND4 mitochondrial gene and a SNP dataset obtained using DDRedSeq. We also did a suite of population genetic analyses and I'll be focusing on a subset of them today. We did a genetic DAPC using the SNP data to do this, we first estimated the number of populations and found that K equaled four populations. This was reflected in the genetic PCA that was done for the DAPC, where we found four different forest groups, the Central Highlands, Kitugala, the Sabaragamo Hills, and the Southern Lowlands. This is also reflected in the DAPC depicted in the structure plot over here. This shows no apparent admixture between forest groups, and each forest group represents a single deem. To find the relationship between populations, we estimated a species tree using BPP. We found strong support for the prior mentioned four forest groups, with the first to diverge being Markandava Forest Reserve or Kitugala Forest Group during the late Miocene roughly 5.45 million years ago. Following this, all of the forest groups diversified following the Pleistocene roughly 1.82 million years ago. We also tested for isolation by distance and found that there was a significant signal for isolation by distance and a strong clinal relationship. We also calculated pairwise p-distances for a more refined look at these relationships. Here we have mitochondrial p-distances between forest groups, and we see the highest p-distance is between the Sabaragamo Hills and Southern Lowlands, and the lowest is between the Sabaragamo Hills and the Central Highlands. For the SNP dataset, we see the highest p-distance is between the Central Highlands and Kitugala, and the lowest is between the Southern Lowlands and Sabaragamo Hills and Central Highlands. We also see the trends in the phylogeny, where we see p-distances with comparisons including Kitugala having relatively higher p-distances than other forest group comparisons. We also calculated p-distances between localities and found that the highest mitochondrial p-distance was between Moripitiya and Hiare from the southern lowlands and Sabaragamo hills, and the lowest is between Karnelia and Dedigala, both of which are from the southern lowlands. 
For the SNP data, the highest is between Dedegala and Markandava from the southern lowland and Kitugala forest groups, while the lowest were within locality P distances. And again, we see comparisons that include Markandava Forest Reserve from the Kitugala forest group, having relatively higher P distances, all of which are above 0.6%. In conclusion, we saw evidence of four forest groups which can be considered as management units for conservation. We see that Kitugala was relatively more divergent from other forest groups which might be due to biogeographic barriers like the Kalania River. We think it also would be best to reconnect forests within the southern lowlands since they are geographically close to each other, have similar climates and are genetically similar. We think it's also extremely important to expand forests within the other forest groups to alleviate edge effects and give the species more viable habitat to expand populations. Finally, we also hope that this study brings more attention to other rainforest endemics that require conservation attention. I would finally like to acknowledge these organizations, institutions, and individuals, and thank you for listening. Hello everyone, my name is Abdul Malik Abdul Kabir Ameza. I'm an undergraduate student researcher from the Department of Plant Biology, University of Northern Nigeria. So today I'm presenting a talk on my research topic, molecular identification of endophytic fungi associated with Telera paradusa. The first thing that comes to mind is why with Telera paradusa, right? Why shed tree? Well, shed tree, as it's commonly called, is uh, an economic, a highly valued economic plant whose products such as shea butter are useful for making cosmetics, candies, soaps, etc. The shea fruits are an important source of food for local communities, and it's been indicated to have high potential to create employment and generate income. But interestingly, right, the tree is currently under great exploitation pressure from exploitation as a result of um, the wood that has been indicated to have a uh, high, to be a good source of um, charcoal. So a lot of people then exploit the tree now, trying to get wood for charcoal. But another interesting fact then becomes that it takes a longer time to reach maturity. So you can then see that if it takes a longer time to reach maturity, and then the tree at an adult and matured level are being exploited for their wood, and are being the tree itself is being under pressure of these plant diseases, we can feel that there's immense need, imminent need to then try to you know, conserve, look for drive efforts towards conserving the tree. The first thing that came to my mind was endophytes, right? Endophytes have been implicated in recent time to produce numerous metabolites that can function to produce, promote growth of plants and help them adapt to their environment. So I felt if we could know these endophytes that are present in this plant, then we could further drive for you know, to understand the physiological functions and biochemical functions they play in these plants. Then by, by understanding this, we could then probably drive efforts towards conservation of the tree. So that was one of the, that was the main reason why I set up on this, my research work. So the main research I did was to identify the endophytic fungi present in the healthy leaves of Vitilera paradigma. So what I then did was I collected the samples that the healthy leaves from the plant, then I did cultural media preparation. The next thing was isolation of the fungi from plant and culturing of the fungi. Then I, I subcultured and did DNA extraction. And I did fungal DNA amplification and sequencing. So I sequenced two regions, two different regions of the um, fungi, that is the TEF1 region and the ITS region. The reason was because I wanted to improve the degree of accuracy of my research work. So I tried to use uh, two different regions. And at the end of the day, I co-catenated these sequence regions through um, uh, using uh, Mega X and um, Aliview and uh, and I leave you on bio edit. So I use this software to try to do the assembly and then the alignment. So then after this, I did the last end search. Um, so at the end of the day, one of my isolated fungi was largely deployed to Burmese. You can see the highlighted session shows the degree of percentage identity that was uh, confirmed. So we have about an average about 99% higher for largely deployed to Burmese. So, like I said earlier, the, I identified the organism based on two regions, as ITS and the TEF1 regions, respectively. So, the, um, the organism, interestingly, has um, is, isolated, is reported to have been 
in have a host range of more than 280 plant species and to be present in more than 70 percent of farms surveyed in nigeria where it is further lead to you um, linked to colossal yield loss of about 80 percent of the harvest so but interestingly this becomes the first time that you deploy that you will me um will be isolated from the healthy from the healthy leaves of vitreria paradoxa it then brings the question and it then becomes interesting here because if there's the first time it's been implicated as a potential in the fight in Vitalia Paradoxa, we then then drive efforts towards understanding the rules it actually play in this um in this plant with the hope that by understanding that we could um we could improve the plant resistance and variability, which are key functions of metabolites that are produced by endophytes and in turn serve as major economic goals. We hope that at the end of the day, uh, through the improved maintenance of the species, we would be able to drive towards um, the conservation of the tree. So thank you all for having me. And um, I think this is where the talk ends. Thank you. Welcome everybody. My name is Dean Zipita Alam, PhD student from University of Douala. I am going to talk about contribution of DNA tipping to the illegal wildlife trade survey in Cameroon. Bush meat or white meat represent a crucial source of animal protein, and cash income for local community. Game extraction in the Congo Basin is estimated at about 1 to 5 million tons, with 16% of the species threatened, mostly mammal. Despite the fact that hunting is forbidden in Cameroon, the bush meat trade remains open and represent annual turnover of 97 million euros. Assessing the trade species at market provides a commonly used measure of its intensity and impact on biodiversity. However, most of carcass sold are already smoked or bushered posing serious challenge to the accurate identification of hunter species. Our first objective was to improve description of the spectrum of species sold on 21 urban and rural Cameroonian bushmeat market based on four mitochondrial genes using the DNA bushmeat people line. Breathing on this result, our second objective was to evaluate which factor may explain the difficulty of visually identifying bushmeat species. The PCR success across mammal order was high. Our approach allowed to assign 93% of sample to species level. 39 species, mostly primate and cetaceous dactyla, were identified. We detected species such as Egyptian mongoose, previously unreported from Cameroonian market survey. We also clarified and improved the taxonomic identification of some problematic tassa such as genet. One species of genon could not differentiate between mona and kroner monkey due to fluctuating taxonomic and or gene flow. One mangabe could not be identified to the species level and can be explained by cryptic diversity within Cercosebus and Papionini. One snake could be related to the African rock python, but with low similarity due to cryptic diversity and or poor referencing of nucleotide data base.
the all of our field identification were corrected or raffined. The smoked state and the primate order are the categories most involved in misidentification. This error can be explained by lack of expertise of some collector and high proportion of smoked carcass. Our approach allowed to confirm the occurrence of protected and threatened species such as chimpanzee, breast monkey, and common pangolins. To some, our approach allows the accurate identification of the bushmeat species sold in Cameroon. This work contribute in filling the existing gap of Cameroonian mammal represented in international archives. We set up an efficient framework for future management strategies of the bushmeat trade in Cameroon. Thank you. Do you know what is the name of the animal that has some resemblance to a horse, a rhinoceros, a pig, and an elephant, but is none of them? That have multiple appearances in the Pokemon series? Right, it's the Sibusiang, the tapirs. The tapirs form their own family tapiridae, separated from the horses and the rhinoceroses, in the order Perisodectala. One of the species, the Malayan tapir, is the main subject of my talk today the current and future aspects of conservation genetics of the Malayan tapir. The Malayan tapir is a large black and white herbivorous animal that plays an ecological role as a seed dispersal in tropical ecosystems. It's the only tapir species in the old world that can be found in Southeast Asia and occurs in three relatively distinct populations. Its population is declining with an estimate of not more than 2,500 mature individuals worldwide, it has been listed in the IUCN Red List as endangered since 2008, facing threats such as habitat loss and fragmentation, road kill, and non-target trapping. Unfortunately, there is a foreseeable further decline in their wild population due to anthropogenic disturbances. Conservation efforts such as cap breeding programs, among others, that often involve individual transfer between breeding facilities are important maneuvers to ensure the continuity of this species, which is often tailored to maximize genetic diversity while minimizing inbreeding. However, the current practice in many facilities rely mainly on the book information. This is mainly due to a lack of genetic tools and data, especially for nuclear genetic markets. And so, I'd like to take this opportunity to talk about some of the work in progress to assess the genetic diversity of the Malayan tapir population in Peninsula Malaysia and in Japanese zoos. First, we conducted genetic diversity analysis using seven cross species microcytula markers that were developed for the lowland tapir and bios tapir. We knew, according to the star book, lineages of some individuals in the Japanese zoos are traceable to Peninsula Malaysia, Thailand, and Indonesia, it was not surprising to see that the Japanese zoos showed a higher genetic diversity and a lower inbreeding coefficient than the wild Malaysian population. Both the DAPC and PCOA plots do not show a distinct isolation between the populations. But nonetheless, the two populations in Peninsula Malaysia and Japan were genetically low to moderately differentiated based on the FST value. I'd like to note that the results should be carefully interpreted due to the presence of kinship relationships and low numbers of both the Japanese samples and the markers. Next, we used the partial sequence of the mitochondria DNA control region and found 11 new haplotypes from Peninsula Malaysian and Japanese samples, in addition to those found in Thai captive population, among which 
three unique hepatitis were only detected in the Japanese samples. From the result, there were two clays of the Malayan tapirs separated by 14.6 million years ago. The Japanese samples, again, showed, con showed to constitute individuals with maternal lineages from both Thailand and Peninsular Malaysia and from both clades. According to the star book, three individuals with their IDs in red were from Indonesian zoos and were found to share two maternal lineage samples in Malaysia, supporting a closer phylogenetic relationship of the populations between these two regions. Quantifying and understanding the distribution of genetic diversity in the Malayan tapir population from both native habitats and captive environments are essential for effective population management. From this study, we learned that the Malayan tapir individuals in the Japanese zoos are genetically diverse and could serve as valuable genetic resource for future management. In the future, we would like to further this research to include more markets and samples from population worldwide and venture into the genomic realm to advance and fine tune what we already know about the Malayan tapir's genetic diversity. I would like to thank all personnel and zoos for their support in this study. I'm Lim Tilan, a doctoral student from Kyoto University, Japan. Thank you very much for listening. Wow, that was super interesting. I would like to invite our speakers to turn on your cameras so I can see all of you, the audience can see you, and we can start the Q&A. So we actually have many different questions coming. And I would like to start with a question for Abhishek Gopal from India. That was a super interesting study and is just the Western Ghats are such an incredible region with all the high levels of endemisms and everything. It was so well designed. I really, really enjoyed your, your study. I One question, uh, so can you tell us a little bit more about the markers that you used and why did you choose those for your study? No, so I didn't create these trees. I used, uh, I already used uh, uh, the global tree and I made from there. So I used V Phylomaker, which is a genus level okay. tree. And then I added my species there. Yeah. Okay. But, uh, but maybe for subset of endemics, we might generate the sequences and then add them to the tree as well. But we are not sure about that at this stage though. Mm -hmm. That is, yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. I, and so you mentioned that uh, you would like to also now explore some of the patterns for of paleoendemism and neoendemism. And is anything about that known for that region, for the Western Ghats? Do we have any information for other groups where that you might be able to use to generate some expectations? I, uh, not, not very uh, comprehensively. You, we know that there are certain groups of... Uh, uh, Meristicaceae, which are found in the lower latitudes, which are older in the Western Ghats, but not comprehensively across. So I think so that way it would be interesting. And I think where my interest is to link this back to ecology. So looking at which uh, niche space these two uh, paleo and neo are occupying currently. So I think that's where I'm headed. But people have talked about certain groups like this, but nobody has looked at them very comprehensively. So I think it would be interesting to go there. With this. And just a last thing out of curiosity, so which are the most diverse plant families in that region? Uh, if you if you look at your uh, your woody plants, I think Lauraceae would come. Your Lauraceae, your Diosparus, all of these are very species. Rubiaceae are there. I think all quintessential very species lineages. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. Thank you. And we have actually several questions for Sabrina. And I'd like to start with the first question from Philippe Gobert. 
And the question, and well, first he starts saying, thank you so much for such an interesting presentation. How did you, you. generate the genomic data? Yeah, so I skipped that in the talk. So we do whole genome sequencing. It has many names, right? Uh, we also you usually call it also whole genome resequencing. So really the whole thing, the DNA extract sent to the sequencer and we want around 10x coverage like that, yeah. Super. And there's actually another question from you for you from Danny Gustafson. And the question is, have you used a Bayesian analysis to generate the time trees? The source of the genetic markers, mitochondria versus nuclear, will affect the analysis. Good study. Thank you. So yeah, uh, that's the work of a postdoc also working on the same data set. Um, it's going on. We are using the, uh, so it's not yet done, but yeah, we're generating that. We're using IQ tree actually. Mm -hmm. hmm. And there's yet another question for you from <laughs> Sean Hankton. And the question is, I was wondering what cutoff point you use to separate old versus recent bottlenecks in inbreeding. Following from that, how did you calculate the 980s point of decline? Great talk, by the way. I really enjoyed it. Good question. Thank you. Also, um, so what uh, what people usually do with whole genome sequencing is they only able to detect old in uh, old uh, demographic events bottleneck around a uh, hundred thousand years ago or in generation even. So that's the limit of the usual whole genome sequencing with Ronsoff homozygosity you can detect as recent as a thousand generations. That's what we meant by recent, uh, actually. So it's more the limit, the limit is the limit of the data set. So the limit of detecting recent inbreeding is currently based on rules of homozygosity is around hundreds to thousand generations, but you cannot detect older inbreeding than that. So so that's so that's it. That's you either detecting the ancient inbreeding using the usual SNP markers, or you detect the super recent one with ransom zygosity. And uh, the 98 piece point is from so that's a quite a simple genetic um, uh, genetic idea. So that when you have uh, your parents. DNA, you got 50% of them, but not exactly 50%. So some of them was broken by recombination during the meiosis. And these segments that we uh, inherited and uh, we inherit to our offspring is broken down in every generation. So there is a, so uh, with the, with more generation, this segment was uh, broken and broken and broken. So there is a distribution of lengths that people can usually use to convert the length of runs of homozygosity into generation time. So with two what two megabases, uh, I estimated with uh, I estimated around 50 generations of uh, meiosis, which means in ANOA because they're uh, usually the adult is having kids at uh, three years old. It means like 50 divided by three, something like that. And I got 1980s from that because I, the samples, the animals was sampled into thousands. So that's where I'm getting the point. But yeah, that needs more um, refining because there's a really rough idea of the common uh, uh, the common idea about how the runs of homozygosity is doing. That's really interesting. And I actually see Sabrina that you posted a question for Abhishek here in the yeah. in the chat. And since you're here, I might as well let you ask the question directly. Please go ahead. Yeah, I was wondering because that's actually the next step you're gonna do, right? You wanna use, uh, you wanna understand the drivers of the over dispersion that you're detecting on some of the areas. So, what have you any idea about the methods you're gonna do about on that? Hey, thanks, Sabrina. That's really interesting. So we are still figuring it out, but I think because the pattern to process linkage is not clear, right? You can yes. have over dispersion with both competition and filtering. 
So yes. I think, yeah, the plan is to uh, select clades which are co-occurring and then through experiments, decide which the relative influence of competition versus filtering in uh, structuring these two. But the challenge is to scale it to the community level. So I think yes. that's, where, that's where we are stuck at. I think uh, to select, uh, what is that, uh, representative clades in a community is easy and to do mm -hmm. an experiment on them is easy. But yes. I think the challenge now is to how do I scale it at the community level because both over dispersion and clustering are community level indices. So yeah, I think, but still, I think it's still a step forward uh, to look at what are these processes which are making them over dispersed. Yeah, I think that's yeah. where we are. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's a quite interesting point of the research because there is a huge criticism on yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. If, if you do uh, if you detect over dispersion, that doesn't necessarily mean yeah you mm. know <laughs> yeah true okay thank good you. luck that's an interesting work mm. thank you thank you so much to both of you and we have now a question for Miss Sato and the question is from Danny Gustafsson and the question is. How old do these plants get? I was just wondering if the genetic signature reflects the heterozygosity when the plants became established rather than what is potentially going to recruit in the modern landscape. Um, I used uh, uh, 166 individual and then uh, 143 individual is our uh, matra tree. So, uh, this value is not in uh, effect the uh, inbreeding quotient. So, so yeah, I answer that. Thank you. And there's another question for you from yep. Philippe Gobert. And the question is, Misato, how do you, ex do you explain the mixed pass pattern in population assignment structure? And have you tested for gene flow among populations, admixture and or IBD, or is it related to your microsatellite markers, the variability? Thanks for your really interesting talk. Uh, okay. Uh, from the result of structure, uh, structure analysis, uh, I assume the two history. Um, one is the uh, reputation of migration and expansion. And second, the division of past large uh, population. So, so I trying to infer the which uh, history is fit to, uh, sorry, uh, which is the true history of this population using uh, DIY ABC, the name of software. But uh, then I want to try to infer the migration rate, but uh, this software cannot assume a migration, uh, migration. So, uh, if possible, I want to try to infer the migration also. Super. I just, I love Dipterocarpaceae. I have never oh. seen it myself, but it's my dream to actually see it one time. Oh. Okay. And, and it was really interesting that, so you found a similar level of genetic diversity, regardless of population density, correct? Uh, yes. Yeah, right. Do you have any explanation for this pattern? Uh, sorry, now it's difficult to explain. Yeah. Just something to think about in the future. Yeah, yeah, I try. Yeah, thank you. Super. It's such an interesting study, really. And yeah, yeah one day I'm going to see the Diptrocarpaceae in person. Oh. It's really a dream I have. Yeah, that's a very big dream for you. Congratulations for your work, really. Yeah, thank you. And we have now a question for Chanel. Oops. Oops. Okay. Wait a minute. Here you are. Yeah, somehow my screen disappeared. And the question is from Danny Gustafsson. And the question is, were your SNPs nuclear or mitochondrial? The time tree with mitochondrial is good. If you included SNP data, you may expect a different dynamic. So 
coalescent anal analyses, expectations would be different. Very cool looking animals. Yeah, thank you so much for the question. And the SNPs are actually nuclear SNPs. Mm -hmm. And we did have a mitochondrial marker. I didn't show the, we didn't estimate time trees with the mitochondrial DNA marker, but we did for the SNP data. Um, we did estimate Bayesian and maximum likelihood trees for both the SNP and mitochondrial DNA markers. And we did find very similar to Chanel, I think it's cutting a little bit. Let's see if we can get her back. Maybe if you try turning off your camera, maybe it will work better. Yeah, now you're back. Yeah, please okay, go yes, ahead. I realized for a second that yeah. things got stuck. Um, I'll try again. But yes, we did estimate um, the new the the SNP data set was nuclear. We did estimate uh, mitochondria. Uh, trees for the mitochondrial DNA, both maximum likelihood and Bayesian trees, but we did not estimate a time tree. Um, but we did find the topologies for all the trees, whether they were nuclear or whether there was a nuclear SNP data set or the mitochondrial DNA marker were very similar, basically retaining those four different forest groups. Very interesting. And well, these lizards are so cool. And you, it, you found a lot of diversification in the Pleistocene, correct? Right. Yes, yeah. we did. So can you, what would be your explanation based on the history, the geological history of that time and the climatic history, perhaps, in that region? Certainly. So sometime during the Pleistocene, there was a uh, interpluvial season, and at that point, uh, these are montane and submontane and lowland. Uh, these are low submontane and lowland forests. And around the interpluvial season at that time, um, there was a lack of rains during the monsoon seasons, and those forests started uh, were started to restrict or end up constricting. Um, and some of those patterns have been seen in certain uh, certain um, angiosperms in Sri Lanka. So this is kind of what we are assuming. Uh, not assuming, but uh, assuming uh, has an, had an influence on the population structure. That's really interesting. And it's also really nice. So you found these four different forest groups, correct? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And so if you had to plan a conservation strategy based on the data that you got, and perhaps maybe, I don't know if there's data also to other rainforest endemics in that, in that region, but based on the data available, um, would you have any thoughts about some practical conservation that could be implement, implemented in that region? Uh, definitely, and this may be slightly idealistic, but I would, um, if at all, I would be focused on the forests within the Southwest, uh, within the Southern Lowlands group. That would have been the purple group on the map over there, and I would uh, we would consider you know trying to reforest that area, maybe reconnect forests within those areas. Um, there are forest complexes within that region as well that were more recently connected, and uh, individuals in that in those areas were more genetically similar as well. Thank you so much. This was super super interesting, and I love learning about those lizards. And indeed, we, we, yeah, I think you're, we really hope your study will really bring attention to other rainforest endemics that are so important. Thank you. Thank you so much. And actually, so I have a question now for Abdul Kabir. And you have such a beautiful and complex study and involving fungi and the design is very uh, complex. I'd like to ask you if you had to, what were the main challenges that you encountered in your study? And if there were things that you would do different from what you did originally? Oops, I think you're muted, please. Yeah. All right. So thank you very much for that question. Um, so one, one of my greatest challenge was uh, the fact that I had to make sure that um, whatever I solicited was actually an endophyte, 
because so I had to take the the, the surface sterilization step very very critically because it was an essential step for you to distinguish between the pathogens and uh, endophytes during the isolation process. And aside that, um, actually across the, across the process of the um, research work, I, I, can, I encountered some problems using um, determ determining which software we must appropriate for every step in time because I. As I earlier indicated in the presentation, I um, made it of two different genetic regions, and that was the TEF1 region and the ITS region. So I had to you know, find my way around how to better concatenate these regions in order to get a very um, an accurate result. So but one thing I would do differently is um, this research, I, I stopped that at the last end search because of the high level of similarity and high level of um, accuracy that I was able to achieve at that stage. But um, I would you know, try to proceed ahead, probably um, construct the phylogenetic tree, which I already worked on. I'm already working on collective phylogenetic tree to give and maybe perform some Bayesian analysis to give it strength and uh, make the data more robust. So I think this is what I can say. This is such an important group that you're studying and there's so little data about it. So it's really, really very important contribution. Thank you so much for your work, Abdul. Thank you. And we have now a question for Alan. So Alan, so thank you so much for your presentation. And we have a question from Sean Hyten. And the question is, do you think the diversity of species in the markers you found will decline in the future, example, in 20 years from now? And which species do you think will decline first? Uh, thank you for this question. Uh, I think that uh, some species are in Bushwin market in Cameroon, such as uh, climate species will be will be disappear in in some year. Uh, for for example, uh, I will cite Russ Monkey. We who we are sorry for my English. Who You're, is it's in, perfect. Endangered we endanger it and all population of cross market in Cameroon is located in north of Sanagar rivers and this the population of this species is very declined this 20 last 20 year though I think that cross market, or common pangolins, Patagonia tricuspis, we we will oh sorry, um, the population of frost monkey and Patagonia uh, pangolins will dramatically decline in next twenty years. Is my answer. Yeah, that's yeah. Sorry Thank for my you. no, not English. at all, oh, not please. at all. Thank you so much. And what I mean, you're addressing such an important issue and the ident correct identification of bushmeat um, species. And yeah, it was impressive. So you you showed forty seven percent of the identification were correct, right? So essentially half of the identifications were not correct. And you mentioned that there is an issue with lack of expertise of some collectors, right? So that's something really worrisome. And we're having, well, fewer and fewer people that are really able to identify the various um, species. Why do you think, you know, well, I mean, how do you think we can solve this issue of lack of expertise of collectors? So additional training, or which kinds of things do you think we can do to contribute to improved capacity building uh, in Cameroon to sort out these kinds of issues? Which kinds of capacity building you think would be most important? 
please, uh, do you repeat your question? Yeah, so you mentioned that there's a lack of expertise, so people were able to identify the species, which is very worrisome, right? And it's a problem we are seeing throughout the world, you know, we need more and more people who, need, who know how to identify different species. And how do you think we can improve this expertise in Cameroon? Like, would you suggest particular training Yes, uh, I think that uh, training in taxonomy in species that um, that we found in Cameroon for customers and and for uh, local people hunters can be can be. Can be helped to improve the this taxonomic identification. Thank you so much. Thank you. Very important you. work. Keep up the good work because it's really important. And we now have a question for Kyu Luan from Japan. And this is there's a question from Dani Gustafon. And the question is. What software did you use to generate your mitochondrial haplotype networks? Yeah, I actually answered it, but I'll just briefly explain it again. Um, I guess we use the real-time uh, algorithm in MegaX um, and to, to estimate the divergence times between the nodes. Um, and I used the calibration point from um, the ancestor of tapir and black rhinoceros, and also the uh, in between the lowland tapir and lowland tapir to estimate the two clades, uh, divergence type of the two lineages of the lowland tapir that I found. Thank you. And we have another question from Philippe Gobert. And the question is, so first of all, he thanks you for your talk, really appreciate it. And then um, he says, so how did you calibrate your mitochondrial divergence time analyses? And how do you explain such large divergence time estimates between the two mitochondrial lineages? Yeah, so the calibration, as I explained in the earlier, uh, it was based on the, uh, between the, the nodes between the Malayan Tapir and Lowland Tapir. So it was about 21.64 million years ago. That's one for the uh, collaboration point. And the other one was the between Black Rhinoceros and the common, uh, and the, I think the Tapirs, which is about 49.95 million years ago. These are from the published, I mean, previously published articles. And then the two limit, the large divergence time that was estimated from the method, I, we believe that it is probably do from doing plasticine because uh, according to the fossil records, um, you know, the South Asia, the Indochina region and the um, Sunday region, um, the oldest fossil found in the north in around the south of Yunnan in China, it was 2.58 million years ago. And the oldest fossil found in Southeast Asia it was, I mean, the Sunday region, it was 0 0.781 million years ago. So we have to say it could be from the cellwork migration during Plasticine time. And then the climate change and sea level further uh, restrict the gene flow between the, these two regions, especially because of the narrow um, corridor between the, you know, the Thailand and the Malaysia. There was a uh, narrow corridor that will expand and then <laughs> become narrow. Uh, plus by the sea level changes from time to time. So yeah, that's uh, the one of the possibility. Very interesting. And I was intrigued by, so you found these two clades that were separated by 14.6 million years. Uh, it's actually 1.46 million years ago. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. of, mm. Okay. And does that make sense in terms of the history of the region, the geological history? Do you have anything to comment based on that? Yeah, I think, yeah, as long, and 
according to the fossil record, I think it's kind of uh, reasonable for, for from the, I mean, for me, it's kind of reasonable that uh, from the fossil record that the divergence at 1.46 million years ago is um, kind of correspond to the, uh, sorry, the time of the fossil records from the north and the south. Um, yeah, so <laughs> I guess. <laughs> Thank you. And it's, well, I mean, tapers are such an iconic mm -hmm. group and I mean, and such important dispersers too. So really providing important forest services and everything. So yeah. seeing all this population decline since 2008, when they have been in the IUCN red list and with habitat loss and fragmentation increasing, it's really, really worrisome. So the fact that you identified so new haplotypes, many unique haplotypes, and were really able to differentiate your populations genetically based on FST, this is really important information. And you mentioned that you might now expand and perhaps you mentioned perhaps new markers or perhaps a broader sample sampling worldwide. Do you want to talk a little bit about your next steps? Sure. Uh, actually, this is my main project in um, Japan right now. Um, that I wanted to focus on development of SMP markers. So we wanted to. Uh, we already sent a few samples actually for whole genome resequencing. So the development of SMP markers is the next step. And then, uh, as I probably have mentioned, um, the markers that uh, was that were used in the this. That in this presentation were actually cross amplified from other tapir species, and there were like seven markers, seven to eight markers only. So, uh, but right now the the progress is that we already have thirty eight uh, micro new microsatellite markers that were developed from the genome sequences developed um, deposited in NCBI database. So that's another thing that we are going to uh, work on and use it use the markers on more samples. Uh, in terms of samples, we have so far uh, sample from Malaysia and Japan, and I'm also wanted to expand it to maybe EA, Europe, EA, EAZA sample, uh, and also and EAZA samples, as well as uh, we are talking to Thailand collaborators and also Indonesia collaborators to get more sample from their captive, um, like zoos and breeding, cent breeding facilities. So yeah, it's pretty exciting for me as well. This was really, really exciting. And I really enjoyed this session. I'm an evolutionary biologist myself. I work on plants and mm -hmm. especially in the neotropics. And in fact, I work with this plant group, the big noniaceae that is right here, a picture behind me. And so I really would like to encourage you to create a group on Whova. So we can continue the, this discussion talking about different genetic markers and talk about how can we maybe do more pantropical studies. So we have here people based in three different uh, continents at least, and these collaborations, pantropical collaborations and looking at organisms, like you mentioned, the possibility for tapir worldwide, they really depend on a lot of collaborative networks. So I really would like to encourage one of you to create a group on Whova, and I would love to continue discussing some of these questions over there. I'm sure others will join and this would be really interesting. So I would like to thank all of you for your excellent presentations, all of them. And since I work with genetic markers, I can really appreciate the difficulty that it is to work with these kinds of markers in the tropics. And so thank you so much. I look forward to continuing the discussion on Whova. I also want to take this opportunity to thank Marcelo Kubu, who's here giving us all the technological assistance behind the scene and thank all the participants, everyone who has been listening, the wonderful questions that we got and let's continue the discussion on Whova. Thank you so much. And we'll see you all in the next session right after the short break. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.